all of that stuff and start piecing it together. And I really didn't probably figure out margins well enough until at least a couple of weeks in. Um, and I think that's also something that you're constantly learning, you know, because if you start getting wholesale for different ingredients, like let's say I'm now getting wholesale pricing for my almond flour and that's now much less and I'm getting more, you know, more for less that has changed my margins too. So I'm constantly having to change margins if that makes sense. Which This episode is brought to you by restaurant systems pro. With excitement, allow me to introduce to you today's guest, owner of Muffin Drop, Emily Eld. Emily, are you feeling unstoppable today? I'm feeling un- unstoppable for sure. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, I am here because our good friend Kara Graves at Uptown Social said you got to talk to this lady. She's killing it. She's Aww. doing a great job. And I, I personally get really excited when I talk to people who are within a couple of years of getting started because starting a, a food and beverage business today is a different game than it was even 10 years ago or five years ago, like 20 years ago, totally different. So getting a fresh perspective, somebody who is starting now and especially the way you're doing it with a minimal viable product, one thing using the, the free resources at your disposal to get started, to keep your overhead as low as possible and to use the tools to grow your brand. Like you're killing it. Yeah, it's and definitely definitely something. Yeah, so I cannot wait to find out, to dive deep into your strategy, the the mistakes you might have made, things you might have done differently, how you've evolved in this two to three year period since getting started. But your story really doesn't start with the business. It starts before that, before we get to where it all begins. Let's get that motivational, inspirational ball rolling with a success quote or mantra. What do you got for us? You miss 100% of the shots you don't take. Good old Wayne Gretzky. <laughs> yeah. yeah. How has that mantra helped you? That mantra is very real for me. I mean, it's not like I say it every single day, but I probably should. I feel like if starting a business taught me anything, it's really that you can't hold yourself back. You have to really try everything and especially the stuff that scares you. Yeah. I mean, I don't even know if this is a quote from somebody, but embarrass yourself. I actually think it might be the woman who started Spanx. She actually talks about that a lot. Um, And I... I I just feel like you have to embarrass yourself, obviously not to a point where you're uncomfortable and doing something weird, but you want to put yourself out there in all the ways that you can. And you kind of have to be fearless about it. And it forces you to evolve every, every time you fall on your face or like lesson learned. Yeah. And the (laughs) lessons, I mean, I think I have to remind myself every day that mistakes are actually the best and you have to make mistakes and they're the best learning lessons. The fear of mistakes will hold you back from ever starting or ever getting better or ever. This is something I'm dealing with right now with these cameras. You know, like this was scaring the crap out of me for the longest time. It was the next phase for me. It was the next step, the next evolution. And still sitting there, if you saw me set these things up, I'm clunky. I'm, I'm confused. I don't know if I'm doing it exactly right. Hey, you did well. But every time I do it, I get a little bit better, Yeah. you know, and and, uh, that is such a great way to get this thing started. So I already kind of gave some like hints and some suggestions of where this story starts for you. But why don't you take us to where you think it makes sense? Where's the beginning? Okay. So the beginning always takes us back to being 15 or 16. Um, But even before that, just to give a little basis of information, my mom had these famous mini muffins that she would make. They were famous, obviously, to our friends and family. But they were banana chocolate chip, and they were just like, they would fill the house with the beautiful smell of banana chocolate chip, banana bread. Everybody has a memory with banana bread. Um, And so move forward to 15 or 16, I developed autoimmune disease. So really, it was already past the point of, oh, we can handle this. Like, it was really bad. It's Hashimoto's thyroiditis, so the thyroid gland in oh. um, your neck or throat. What does the thyroid gland even do? So it controls so much. It controls your hormones, like metabolic function. There's like anything from cognitive can get affected. It's really a, like a whole body experience when your thyroid gets messed up. Um, so we didn't know at the time what it was. And, you know, at that time, we had been doing everything in modern medicine, just as most people have done their whole life. And we went to the doctor and we were like, what is going on with me? I was 30 pounds overweight. I had chronic inflammation. And we didn't even know really what inflammation was. It's just like I was so inflamed. I just didn't even look like myself. And I was falling asleep at like 3 p.m. I was exhausted. And 3 p.m. is actually a a very important time with thyroid. That really shows you if you're really tired at that time. Something's going wrong. My adrenals were stressed out. I started developing all these different food allergies. And I had never had food, like food allergies prior to that. And so my digestive tract was messed up. So we go to the doctor and they look at me and they're like, oh, you're okay. And I'm like, did you hear everything I just told you? Like, I am not okay. Yeah. You know, like I'm really down bad. And I was like 15 or 16. So at that point, you, you really don't know. You're just trying your best. 
um, on top of high school and you know going through all those adolescent experiences. So it really prompted us to start this journey of like taking our health into our own hands. And my mom, the badass that she is, she's like, we're not going to stop at this answer. We're going to keep going. And it introduced us to um, holistic medicine and functional medicine and, you know, utilizing food to heal. And one of my first doctors, well, we went through like three to five in the beginning just to kind of see who we resonated with. But they were like, you know, your diet is extremely important with how you live your life, how you um, just like run in life. And it's like the gas that you put in your car, you know, and what it, were you eating before this? You know, everything normal, like gluten, dairy, all the processed goods, you know, everything like that, nothing organic. And it just wasn't the knowledge that we had. It, and we, we didn't really think about it, you know, and this doctor was like, you need to start detoxifying your body. And something that you can start doing is you can go plant-based and really hyper fixate on plants in your diet almost. And I, I always resonated with vegan veganism or being vegan. Um, because when I was in first grade, I literally told my parents, I don't want to eat meat. I had nothing to trigger me. Just my body just didn't really resonate with meat. And it was funny because I started eating meat a bit after that, like in high school, like I would only eat chicken. I wouldn't eat anything else. It was just chicken, no fish, no anything. Um, I then introduced a little bit of fish, but there was no other meat. And so when the doctor was like, you should go plant-based and vegan, I was like, oh, old hat. Like, let's do that. But the gluten, that, that is what killed me. Yeah. I was a pasta freak. Like, I probably gave myself a gluten allergy. I, I have a gluten in, like sensitivity. Mm -hmm. Like, if I, if I eat it, I can definitely feel like, ah, just yeah. I'm not the same. Mm -hmm. But it's so good. It's so good. <laughs> and I... I, I mean, I like, I'm a, I'm a gluten hoe. So you, I'm the you try to be a restaurant business yeah. podcast and everybody throwing gluten, gluten in your face. And you're just like, yeah, that pizza looks all right. I'll, I'll try. Exactly. It. I guess I can be your exception for today with some <laughs> yeah. gluten free muffins. But anyway, so all of that trajectory led me into food as healing. And, um, I, I obviously couldn't eat my mom's muffins anymore. So I was like, okay, what am I going to do? And I just started searching the internet and kind of like went crazy because I was just super interested yeah, at this point. Yeah, yeah I, I just wanted to make up muffins and it kind of just became this like obsessive thing that I went through and I was so excited. So what's the significance of the muffin? Like talk, like why muffins? Why muffins? Honestly, I just loved those muffins so much. And I feel like muffins just like, well, okay, let's actually take it away from muffins and go to banana chocolate chip. Like okay. That flavor, I think everybody has a memory for. It's so good. Everybody can think about their grandma's recipe or their aunt's recipe or somebody, whoever in your family. Like that smell of banana bread is what just triggers you. So for a whole year when I started my business, I only sold banana chocolate chip. It was like, there's nothing else. I was almost like, I'm not even going to make another flavor. Well, I think that's a good idea. Like you start, you have a minimal viable product, right? Yeah. One thing, one thing, what yeah. else? And then ask people like, oh, like I wish you had this flavor. Oh, okay. Oh, wow, that sold really well. Maybe we should, you know, like you don't yeah. know what you like, but the starting small, I think is the, the, the best way to do it. Yeah. And I think really early on, I realized that I didn't want to overwhelm myself. Like I knew I, I, I loved to bake and still love to bake all different things, but the muffins were something I knew how I was doing like so well at it. And I was like, why would I steer away from this? And then also once I started making other flavors, it was like, okay, let's just use this base and just kind of keep rolling with that. And so what like, yeah. Are you allowed to talk about the, like what is the base? Is it like so? I make my own flour, so okay. that's I think something that's going to be always really exciting. You as grind we grind it, so I we mean? mix it, we full mix it. Like like my whole life, I was always mixing it with my hands, and I didn't even realize I had my own flour mix like on, on my hands when I was making these products. And then finally, it hit me. I'm like, wait, I'm using the same flour <laughs> in every single muffin that I'm making. I think it was when I started recipe testing for other flavors. I was like. I started messing with the flour proportions and the muffin would come out wrong. And so then I would use the same flour proportions and I was like, wait, I can keep making flavors off of this flour ratio. And so it's a mix of almond flour, coconut flour, and arrowroot starch. Okay. And um, yeah, so I mix that up and then it creates the fluffiness and the moisture. Where'd you go to learn about all this stuff, especially in like 2000? <laughs> was there a lot of resources online? At no, this no, not at all. There's I... Oh yeah. I was going to say there's one lady I actually had on the show who um started uh Halfway Half Hal Hail Life Bakery. Does that sound familiar? I don't know, but I need to look into them. But it's same kind of the same story where her and her son were just like her son got sick and then and like I think it might have just been her son, but like her, or maybe it was a daughter, but like somebody got super sick and she went to like every place to figure out like what can I feed my kid? Yeah. And they couldn't find anything, so they just started testing recipes. Yeah. And then once they 
I think I think they started like a blog too, where they're like taking like taking people through their journey of like, yeah, this is what we're doing. This is like this is what we're discovering, and they started sharing recipes, and they made this incredible community, this online community around people like you who were faced with like this 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 dilemma of like i can't eat the things i love I, yeah I'm, i want my muffins right i just want my freaking muffins yeah. and i can't eat my muffins anymore and that's actually a really important thing to kind of break off of i was so almost like pissed off at how the quality of gluten-free and vegan goods were back then so i think part of my obsession with making my product was like okay i just want it to taste like a normal I just want to be good. delicious <laughs> yeah. product like i want somebody i don't even want to tell you it's vegan and gluten-free like i want you to eat this and be like oh my god that's so good um but at the time like when it all started once i was told okay you need to remove gluten and you're gonna go vegan and you're gonna start eating more organic and get rid of the gmos and you know all the things i was like okay well where am i gonna go and i just started researching you know you got to just plug and play like YouTube was my best friend. Yeah. So I really went towards the vegan YouTubers, the gluten-free YouTubers be, and everybody makes fun of me. Like my boyfriend and I, we only watch YouTube. Like we don't really watch shows. I could start watching more YouTube mostly because I, I want to get inspired by like what other travel. Yeah. Like, like what other travel. You got to get doing. into YouTube and it is the best because I think since I have such a intellectually like curious mind, you can just type whatever you want in the search bar and then anybody with passion about that topic just goes on and yeah. goes off about it. So that was the vegan and gluten-free yeah. stuff. This is a good time for me to pitch that I am sharing more behind the scenes stuff. We're actually just talking about this yeah. before we hit record. Uh, I'm getting much more comfortable with these cameras and I'm doing a lot more talking and just like into the camera. So head over to restaurant stop of podcast, YouTube channel, please subscribe. And my selfish pitch is over. Continue your train of thought. Selfish pitch. I love that. <laughs> I mean, I'm like a freak about YouTube. I love, I love everything about it. Um, I probably need to get on YouTube myself actually now that we're talking about it. So maybe this will inspire me, but yeah, just a lot of um, digging around online and finding people who had had stories similar to me if I could and blogs and piecing together different people's recipes to figure out what resonated what most with me and to build something. And I think at one point I had like five different recipes that I was pulling from. Can you toss me one of those muffins real quick? I got to check these things out while <laughs> I'm talking. I'm so interested. So you brought me What do we have? Muffins. This is the coffee cake muffin. This is the coffee cake. I'm going to throw this. Those are my again. boyfriend and my mom's favorite. Those are kind of like a cult favorite. Like people who love the coffee cake, they love the coffee cake. Yeah, <laughs> I love coffee cake. So um, you didn't master this overnight, though, is the point that I'm trying to make. It, yeah, it wasn't no. like when you were 16 years old, you tested a recipe and it went gangbusters. It took No, years. it took me years. It took me, I think by the time I was, so I, at 15, that's when I developed autoimmune immune stuff. I started baking really as a form of therapy for all the autoimmune stuff that I was going through. How do you just develop it? That's one thing I'm curious about. How, how is this something you're not born with? How autoimmune like, disease? Yeah. So this, you know, this goes into a lot of different parts of the, um, there, yeah, there's a I'm little, struggling. I know <laughs> DHEC and um, USDA make you put the label over the opening <laughs> to keep it fresh. But like, um, I don't get into this. <laughs> yeah, just I know people just rip it open from the sides too. And I'm like, whatever you got to do to get that oh, muffin in your nice. mouth. And like, I noticed that the, the gluten free muffins, um, so just got it. <laughs> I've noticed the gluten-free muffins in my in the past are always so like dry. Yeah, that's why you've got to have the moist muffin drop. Oh my god! So <laughs> first bite. Oh man. Okay, I love that response right that's away. That's gluten-free. That's gluten-free. That is plant-based. Vegan? That is all the things. Vegan too. Fully vegan. Damn girl. All the things you got in that refined sugar-free. So we only use coconut sugar in the base wow. of our product. So you're not going to find white sugar, even brown sugar. So we try to keep it as ref like unrefined as possible. That's good. Yeah, thank you so much. That's real good. I love a live review. I'm happy that there's two in this bag. Um, but there three? Yeah, there's three. So yeah. that's really what I kind of moved into. So the whole three-piece bundle thing. Dinner. Yeah, <laughs> I hope uh, we can give you more <laughs> to really substantiate you. But you'll feel good after three, I promise you. Uh, I mean, so yeah, not only is this delicious, but I'm sure it's, it's probably like this is like health food. Yeah, I mean, what? Okay, so I'll walk you through some of the ingredients in that. So you have our ingredient base or our flour ingredient base, which is the arrowroot, the almond flour, the coconut flour. And then I sweeten with only maple syrup or coconut sugar. I was, I was just saying um, in that you have a little coconut sugar and cinnamon. I can chew this with my tongue. Yeah, right. That's I so know, good. especially because I was like, okay, I'll leave them out so they get a little bit nice and moist. Um, and then there is, what else do we have in there? Almond milk. We've got vegan sour cream, not the junk filled one i use forager which is really nice and clean um you and then yeah New Hampshire? yeah i ship everywhere we <laughs> ship nationwide ba nationwide baby I'm some news to my sister <gasps> oh yeah uh, love that so um so th i think the, the big thing i wanted to, to take away early is like 
you know, if you have a passion, if you if you create something like this that deserves to be shared, and it sounds like once you like dialed in the recipe, you started what, like what was next for you? Yeah. So I once so the dialing in of the recipe really didn't happen until the pandemic. So I had been, as I was kind of saying, obsessively like just out of therapy, always trying to build what the recipe was for my banana chocolate chip muffins. And every year I'd kind of figure out, okay, like baking soda, this, salt, this, like leave them in the oven for this amount of time. Um, But they would always turn out different. And I was like, what the heck happened? And like one time my best friend's mom who owns a restaurant, who's an amazing chef and all the things, she was like, are you measuring your wet ingredients? Are you measuring your banana? Like, are you getting the, the ratio it, like to a T? And I was like, oh no, I'm doing it different every single time. <laughs> and that was like one of the big things that taught me a baking lesson of like, okay, this is how we can streamline and get the product to look the same every single time. Are you measuring with like measuring cups or weight? Um, wait. And um, we were doing measuring cups or no, we, I was just putting the bananas in. I was using like three, four, however many, you know, yeah. I wasn't even measuring like to a T or grams or anything like that. So then the pandemic came and we were all locked inside and I was like, okay, what am I going to do? Bake muffins every single day. So I just was like, you so know, you, you graduated in 2020, right? Yeah, I graduated literally right when the pandemic hit. We went on spring break for my senior year, second semester, and we never went back to school. Where were you in spring break? Um, oh, <laughs> we were going to go to Nashville, but they everything got shut down, so we couldn't go to Nashville. I was in um, Florida for spring break of 2020. Oh, wow. And I just remember just thinking to myself, no, it was, 20, no, it was 2021 where things were still like oh, starting yeah. to loosen up. And I thought, like, oh, there's nobody going to be in Florida. Oh, like, no. Everybody was in Florida. Everybody was in Florida. Was everybody like, moved to Florida. And I, and I hadn't had COVID yet. And I was like, if I haven't had it yet, I'm definitely getting it. Yeah. Oh, trip. my God. I mean, yeah, that makes sense. But, um, yeah, so spring break happened. I was at College of Charleston. We never came back from spring break. So after that, it was a lot of cooking, baking. And I was sharing it, actually, on my personal Instagram. And um, that was something that kind of got me started like with sharing because I never felt comfortable to ever post on my story or anything like that. And then I was like, okay, I'm stuck inside. What else am I going to do? And really started just sharing on Instagram. I'm going to do a timeout and put something in front of this door because it keeps bugging me. The light keeps shifting. Here, you want to do this trash can? Yeah. The question I want to ask you when I get back is like, how did the evolution of sharing, like once you first started sharing and how did that change over time? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. I'm not just acting. These are really delicious muffins. <laughs> Thank you, know you so time. much. I wish I had the classic one for you, but the coffee cake is a really solid one for no, you to be it's eating. It's pretty solid. Yay. All right. So you started sharing. Yeah. You started getting yourself out there more. What were the first posts like? What, like how it was a lot of story. Through? story sharing so and it was all on my personal Instagram because I was like well this is my friends my family you know I'm just gonna start sharing and I was cooking so much I was making vegan recipes and I was like oh well this is cool to share like in the pandemic everybody is bored so I'm just gonna start sharing on my story like what I made that night like vegan spring rolls or vegan buffalo wings and all that stuff and obviously the muffins were involved in that but I really just started for the first time ever like sharing on stories and all that and um then it trickled a little bit further down and um, I was sharing every single day pretty much on that. And then I, when I actually ended up um, being like, okay, well maybe one day I'll just like sell these muffins. Cause up until this point, a lot of people were like, are you going to sell these one day? And I'm like, when the hell am I going to sell muffins? So when you first started sharing these muffins on yeah. your story, what was like, what was the, were you just like taking pictures of the process of making them or like the either the process product? or literally the product, but yeah. more so the just sharing the muffins came once I was like, should I sell these? Um, but yeah, I was just taking pictures of the food or maybe how I was making it. Like, so what was the objective before you decided to start selling it? Were you just sharing your passion? Yeah, I was just doing it for fun. Everything of this is passion based. I, I, I think I told somebody, somebody the other day was like, so are you going to like do this, whatever? And I'm like, this is passion funded. Like somebody was like, how are you paying for this? I'm like passion funded. Like everything of my soul is just in these muffins. But this is the best way to start. <laughs> and it's seriously yeah. like all the best stories I've captured on the show. It starts with somebody was like, I just would cook this thing because I love cooking it and I would just tell my friends to come over. Yeah. And then more friends started to come over and then eventually I couldn't do it in my backyard anymore and I had to like go someplace yeah. and, or I would go to someone else's yeah. house and do it or and then somebody was like you should sell these. Yeah <laughs> and I also think with food like you almost need that because 
you, you need to hear repeatedly that this food product is good because people with food are ruthless, you know, yeah. like they're like, eh, that's crap, you know, right. like if that's not good. So I would just hear all the time, like these muffins, these muffins. But I, ne- I literally never thought I was going to sell muffins, like never thought I just never did. But my dad, funny enough, he was always like, did you record? Like, did you write down what you did this time? Did you write that you changed the temperature? Like I would always go and run into their room and be like, oh, so I decided this degree for the oven and I put this in there and my dad's like, did you write it down? And I'm like, I mean, it's in my head. Um, so then moving forward after our sharing in the pandemic, all that stuff, my boyfriend and I, he actually was like, let's start doing social media for people. And that was like the first time I ever did anything entrepreneurial. And it was like, oh, you can make money by like helping people with a service. That's cool. And so we were doing social media for like real estate clients and travel people or travel what's the travel luxury travel clients <laughs> and um people I, looking to do luxury travel or yeah like who uh, advisors traveling. travel advisors is that what they're called <laughs> uh like the people who plan trips there's a there's a name for them we'll come to we'll mind. come back to yeah. that but either way th- those are the types of people we we're helping and i think one day i was like wait okay so like we did this for them they pay us i'm not working for anybody i get to make a schedule that's pretty cool and i was like maybe i have the courage now everybody's always told me like sell these muffins. And I was like, I've been posting them on my story a lot, like during the pandemic, like maybe I'll just be like anybody you want to buy them. Yeah. Yeah. Travel (laughs) agents. That's what they're called. Travel agents. But I was like, maybe I'll just do it today. And like, I was like, okay, I'm just going to post on this story. Anybody want to buy these? And that day into the next day, 30 orders off the bat. Who ordered them? Friends, family, people had been telling me like, can you, can you sell these? And I was like, okay, I guess we're just in this. And it felt so natural. Yeah. I, I feel like especially recently too, like there's more and more people are just choosing to go vegan and gluten-free just because they notice it makes them feel better. Yeah. And there's, there's a demand and, and you, there's literally nothing. Well, maybe not literally, but there's very few options of good gluten-free, vegan-free options. Out yeah. There. So like, if you're somebody who's made this, this choice, like you are a godsend for them. They're like, finally, <laughs> a moist muffin I can (laughs) eat and not hate the fact that I've made this life choice. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I mean, that's probably the only reason why I do it. You know, at the end of the day, like I love, like for instance, somebody today was like, I have celiac and I am so excited whenever you drop these muffins off at one of my wholesale locations. Like, cause I don't have anything that can, you know, taste this good and have this texture. And I'm like, that's like, when I hear that, I don't think people really understand the impact that has on me. Like it makes me honestly just so emotional when people tell me that. Cause I'm like, that's the reason, like I was pissed off when I started this cause nobody had something that tasted or had this texture like this. And so it's amazing when I keep getting stories like that and the product keeps improving and people, you know, I just love the responses about it. Like that, that is the best part. And I hope as we grow, we can just reach more mouths, you know? So, and ears with this podcast. And ears. Hopefully using mouths and ears. Th- this podcast to reach more ears, you do reach more mouths. Yeah, um, so, uh, when you were doing the social media stuff, what were you learning? Did, were you like, cause is your, is your boyfriend a big social media person? Was he good at social media or? Yeah. I mean, he's just like so tech focused. Like he, my boyfriend and I, we have a very collaborative relationship. We've been together since high school. I'm jealous of your relationship. By <laughs> the way. If there's any single ladies out there that want to travel the country and do social media. Yes, like, right here. Single guy. Single guy looking, right here with a whatever, lot of oh skills. <laughs> no joke. Whenever I hear about like, I think I would love, I think there's something about living intentionally and like your life partner also being your business partner. And some people are like, no. No, like we thrive in a business setting. Like we are probably too business oriented together, but like no matter what he's doing or what I'm doing, we constantly are creatively collaborating. Like I feel what drew us together in the beginning was the fact that we had this creative, like anything. It would be like, okay, you're going to post this. And he has this one vision of how like he'll be focused on a grid and how it looks. And for me, I'm more about a vibe. Like does this flow with this edit or with this sound or, you know, I, we just collaborate. Does this color go with this? I'm more of a visual. Yeah. And working alone sucks too. Yeah. Like sitting in a room by yourself all day and working is to me like the horror. Like, like, but working with somebody and feeding and like yeah. masterminding and like, like, like here's an idea. Well, here's an, like, and like slingshotting off yeah. each other's ideas. One on one is so awesome. Yeah. Like I love a one on one collaborative relationship. And I also just love, I mean, anytime you can get inspiration from anyone, like that's my favorite thing. Like I love that we get to do this and I can hear about everything you're doing because all of this stuff is, I mean, I don't know. I just love anything that's new and it creates inspiration for me, you know? Yeah. So um, what, what lessons are you learning from the social media, like picking up clients? Like, so you had travel agents you're doing social media for and who were the other people? Um, different like architecture. It was all to do with like homes and 
traveling, um, real estate. Oh yeah. We had a real estate client. Um, so I mean, honestly, mostly from what I learned, it wasn't about like their industries and things like that, but how to cater to a client, how to communicate with clients, how to even do anything that's entrepreneurial, like create price packages and like, you know, go out and do all the shooting on your own and kind of do the, all the multifaceted things that come in to owning a business. Because not only are you planning their content and shooting the content, you're also piecing it all together, emailing them, finding new clients. Oh my gosh, the sales aspect. I love sales and both my parents were in sales. So I think it's probably just, you know, something I learned young, but, um, yeah, I think the sales was awesome and emailing and trying to scout out new people. I think just all those skills, you know, there's so many things you learn no matter what industry you're in. You just learn so much. So what what was the tipping point for you? When did you, what happened in your life where, you know, you had, it wasn't like it was new that people were reaching out to you and saying you should sell these. This is something that was happening over yeah. and over again. What happened? Like when were you like, I'm going for it? Burst what? of inspiration. Burst of inspiration, from? courage, actually. It was a minute of courage. And I think especially when you share anything of yourself with the world, it's super vulnerable. And obviously you have no idea if anybody's even going to message you and that could like tear your soul up. But I think probably somewhere in my body and in my brain, I knew that, okay, I'm making these muffins for a reason, right? Like we're probably, I hope maybe we could do something with them one day. So I think one day when I really just felt it, I was like, I'm just going to post. Like, let's see what happens. It was just a feeling in that moment. It was a gut feeling, you know, and any, anything after that, it just happened and it flowed and it was just really meant to be, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I think now's a good time to take a break to thank our sponsors and we'll be right back to talk about how you from first sale to where you are today. All right. We are back and you sell your first muffins. Yeah. Um, how did you sell them? Like where, where did this trans, this transaction take place? So fully started in my parents' kitchen when I was living in Connecticut. So this was, what is this? So this was 2021. Um, and it was winter, lots of snow going on outside. A little and so, over two years ago. Yeah. So I, um, I started making them in the kitchen as I'd been making them all high school and you know, all of that. And sorry, one second. I need a burp. Yeah. <laughs> um, the water's coming up. Sorry about that. Um, but sorry, I was in my parents' kitchen and where I'd been making them all of high school. And that's where I was living at the time. Cause I had moved home from college cause the pandemic and I was living in Connecticut doing all the social media stuff. And so when I released on my story one day and got all those responses, I was like, Oh, I need to figure out what these muffins are going to be sold in. So I think I ran to like Michael's or something, or maybe I even got it off Amazon. I wish I knew, but I no, I definitely didn't get it off Amazon. I was not planning. It was from Michael's. And so I ran to Michael's found these Brown boxes. Actually that I got the Brown boxes, but the first thing was like a cake box and it was like not going to be um, very lucrative if I kept selling them yeah. those cake boxes, like literally like $10 for three boxes. Um, but you don't know. Box. Exactly. Yeah. So I had them in like these cake boxes and tied them with a bow. And I was writing all these handwritten notes, like breaking my hand, writing all these handwritten notes, like essays. It wasn't just like, thanks for the muffins. I was like, thank you so much. You don't know how much this means for, to <laughs> me. Like personalizing the messages. Um, just got everything that I could. I was like, this aesthetically looks cute. I'll get some ribbon on there just going to wake up and start baking them. And I think uh, I went to the grocery store the day prior and they didn't have the ripe bananas. And I was freaking out and looking up online. How do you make these bananas ripen quicker over the night? Because you need the bananas yeah. nice and ripe as we know with banana bread. And I think I like put them in a brown bag and I was like praying, like, please be right by the time I wake up. Just knocking on your neighbor's doors. Let me see your bananas. Right. I honestly, <laughs> I have done that. Like you don't actually know how many people I need to thank for the bananas. <laughs> they've donated me in the beginning of this company. But, um, so yeah, and then that morning I woke up like 7 a.m. We started making all the muffins and I had, I, I'm pretty sure it was like 30 orders and it was all in these cake boxes and I have pictures from that time and it was really cute. And So 30 orders, how does that trend, how many muffins is that? So I think when I started, I was selling a ridiculous amount of muffins per person. I think I was selling like 20, 20 per person. So 20 times 30, two times 30, 600 muffins? Yeah, it was a crazy... It was a crazy beginning. Like those first couple weeks were a lot of muffins. And I was just like, here we go, here we go, here we go with my, and at that time I didn't have my baking tray that I have now that can do like 48 at a time. So I was doing it in my mom's like vintage, like 24 whatever. So I was just waiting for them to bake. Okay. Oven come out, like just over and over again. And it was so fun. Like I was like, oh cool. I get and to like sell how, my muffins. How do you know what the charge is for these? 
that's the thing. You don't. Like, that was the craziest part. I was like, I have no clue. Like, I've never sold a product. I, I had, especially food. But what you do, and I think anybody who wants to be an entrepreneur, you literally just start re- researching. And I'm sure, or I'm not sure, I know for a fact I was undercharging. I think everybody probably does in the beginning. But I was way undercharging. I wish, I, I don't even remember what I was I think it was like 10 bucks for the 20 muffins. And like, it doesn't even make sense. Covering your costs. No, and also doesn't even cover the cost. Like these are vegan, gluten-free, GMO, like free. Yeah, like you're not using cheap ingredients to be able to do this. Not cheap. And so the price point for the ingredients is already high. So I, you know, I had to just look online and I think I just looked up like how to, what is like how to create a margin or, you know, profit margin for different um, food baked goods. And I saw all these equations from this one woman's blog post. And I was like, okay, I'm just going to start working with this. And at that time, who the woman was, uh, I have the link, but I don't have the woman. Like I have, it was just a Google website that I found. Is it it making dough by any chance? Oh my God. I I really don't know. We're going to have to go through my phone afterwards. I might know these people because like what you're Googling, what you're looking for is basically, you know, the the people I talk to. Well, I, we can we can go through my. I probably have it in my notes from I, like. I do have a whole episode dedicated to menu engineering. For the oh. record, if people are listening to this, oh, like I want to know where. Like David Scott Peter, uh, founder of Restaurant Systems Pro, uh, sp- spells it out. Oh, and, and I wish we got like that's some awesome. Yeah, it was really great. But um, so you, you did the research. What did you What did you learn? So I think I realized how you have to have your co- your cost of goods, and then how like the time that you're spending to make it to into that equation and then the you know the price of your goods and how much you're going to charge it um charge it for and all of that stuff I started piecing it together and I really didn't probably figure out margins well enough until at least a couple weeks in um and I think that's also something that you're constantly learning you know because if you start getting wholesale for different ingredients like let's say I'm now getting wholesale pricing for my almond flour and that's now much less and I'm getting more you know, more for less, that has changed my margins too. So I'm constantly having to change margins, if that makes sense, which right. is really exciting. Dynamic pricing. And that's one thing we are guilty of in the restaurant industry and your food and beverage. We said it and we forget it. Mm. And we live in a dynamic, fluid world. Yeah. Where especially recently, the cost of goods going up. And I think yeah. this is where we get in trouble, where we're like, we're so afraid to charge the the, the value, the something. We're, it's worth something. Yeah. Know your worth. Yeah. And charge for it. And don't be apologetic. Yeah. If people piss and moan, be like, you can't afford to eat this. And also I'm something sorry. I, well, <laughs> and like I, I keep here, I get messages all the time that say a similar, um, experience of like, okay, well, what are the medical bills going to cost? So if you fed yourself well and you fueled yourself well and you paid that extra price point, that's a, yeah, and that's exactly. Sorry, did I cut you short? Oh no, no, that's that's, that's exactly the point too. It's like, so t- typically we 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 build up to this part of the conversation, yeah. of the podcast, where it's like, where is the industry? Where are we headed? What can we do to transform the industry? And I think that a part of the issue is that just there's a messed up values. People yeah. don't value the f- that the food they're putting in their body. Like yeah. we use, people used to spend upwards of twenty percent of their income on food oh, like 50, 60 years ago. Yeah. And then we commercialized the food system. We centralized it. We made food cheap and fast. And we we our perception of the value of food got warped. Yeah. And now people think food should be cheap. But what happened to us as Americans? We got a reputation for being a bunch of unhealthy big old fatties. Yeah. And we felt like shit. You yeah. Know? Like we did it to ourselves, you know? Yeah. And I mean, this is just something that I always want to continue educating on. Cause it's just been my life story at this point, like really healing through food. And also I'll be very honest. Like I don't have one approach towards food. One approach works for me, but that might not work for you. And so I really understand that health is a by person experience, if that makes sense. And so the foods, I mean, we can all agree that more plants is very healing for everybody on the planet, but I'm not somebody who's like, okay, well it would make sense for you to necessarily go vegan, but it could be, but I do think everybody can learn from vegan going vegan yeah. for a period of time, you know, no two people are exactly the same. No two There's people are exactly the same. Certain people where depending on your, your genome, like where you're from, your ancestors, heavy meat diets in like your body, your, you evolve yeah. for that. Um, Anyway, but it, I feel we could get lost in that. But it really is something. And like, I feel like it's so helpful to just try a bunch of different things once you realize that nobody's body is the same. Because I think we all go into trying to do the same diets as other people and thinking that because that worked for somebody, it's going to work for somebody else. Right. And I think a big part of my healing experience is not getting dead set on just like one option and trying a bunch of different things because even when you go into being just vegan and gluten-free then you have grain-free which the muffins are grain-free and 
not including grains in a lot of uh, autoimmune patients' diets is really helpful because a lot of grains can kind of have a similar reaction in the body as gluten may, maybe not as um, extreme as somebody with like celiac, but there's different, you know, phases and then excluding sugar from your diet and re refined sugar. There's so many different pockets. And I think that's been something so fun for me to try everything out and see what works for me. And now I'm 10 years into my experience with autoimmune and I've tried everything. I mean, I'm not going to say everything cause I will always be open to other things too, but it's done so much just being open-minded and not getting stuck on just one way of eating or one way of excluding things and doing all the different things because now I'm healthier than I've ever been. And it's been through being inquisitive and trying different things and researching and, you know, and not having a, you know, prior opinion on things. Interestingly enough, what you just said in, t in reference to your personal health and how you're constantly trying new things and sticking with what works and what doesn't work is exactly how to run a business. Yeah, that's true. What works for somebody else's health might not work for you in your like you know or so what, what sorry what works for somebody else's business yeah might not work for you in your business yeah based off of your strengths your values your vision uh, the people you have the resources you have to work with and as your business grows what worked for you two years ago might not work for you today totally. it's a constant evolving changing beast and yeah. you can't compare yourself to others you can learn from others and you can you can pull bits and pieces from different people yeah kind of like what you do with your recipes and your food and like going to different people yeah you know? i think that the going to different people and asking as many questions as you possibly can like sometimes i'm like i'm probably being annoying by how many questions i'm asking but i just love to learn because I, you really have no experience like somebody else with starting a business like everything can be different no matter if somebody else started a muffin business we could have two completely different layouts for how we're going to do anything and it's also very independent about how you exist as a person like owning a business is a very big um self-development process because you learn so much through the energy that you put into the business about what you're doing to your own life and how you lead your own life and how you lead with other people and you know how you organize things and how you plan things and i think that is constantly my battle and just you know experiencing all these different things and learning from it and yeah all those different pathways and the people that get yeah. you there so back to your your entrepreneurial business evolution so you you launch your you're like, who wants to buy these muffins? And you did this on Instagram and Facebook? So Instagram. Instagram? Yeah. Um, how did you collect payment? Venmo. Okay. So, <laughs> Venmo. So they would put or an cash. order in, i.e. direct message you? Yeah. And you would DM reply me. with, here's my Venmo? Yeah. It started with started with Venmo because I was like, how else am I going to do it? You know, I didn't have my website for it. Um I, I feel like we talked about like technology off camera, but I'm always a little bit late to the technology. So once I find a technology, I'm like, oh, why wasn't I using that this entire yeah. time? I, but I you, like it, this happened that. when I developed my like at the muffin drop Instagram handle prior to that. I mean, I think there was a lot of benefit in this, but since I had started with my personal page, so I hadn't created a muffin drop page. It was all just my original Instagram. I've since started a new one, but it was just at Emily Eld. And it was all my friends and my family. And I was like, that's probably the most beneficial way to start. Like everybody in here already knows my experience. Maybe they're going to want to buy the muffins. So for me, that was a great launching point because I was just in this class at College of Charleston. They asked me to come in and speak. And this one girl was like, so what's like a good starting point? I'm like, your friends and family. And like, they have a lot of connections too, who then will connect to you. And so my original Instagram page, just my personal, that's where I took everything. And then once I felt like people knew about the muffin drop, that's when I started the muffin drop Instagram page. And then that was all the streamlined content of the brand. So what was your strategy getting the word out there? Do you I mean you went to friends and, but, but once you got the traction with friends and family and you wanted to move beyond that, yeah. you, you started your own Instagram. What was the content like? What was the, what was the, what were you posting? What, yeah. How did you get people from post to purchase? Yeah, it was, you want to know the best part. It started with stories and then it continued with stories. So the beginning part of the business was other people buying the product and then taking a picture of my cute little package and then putting it on their story. And then from that, I would get like five followers from that or this, this and that. And everybody would store story it. And it kind of became a thing. Like everybody would take their cute box. So it was a little Brown box that I would tie with a string. You'd have your muffins inside with a little card. And then people would story that and I would leave it on their porch and all different things. And people would post on their Instagram. And that's really the beginning of the business. And then after that, it's very word of mouth. And just like talking to people everywhere you went and people asking, what do you do? And I'm like, I sell muffins. <laughs> so when did you get to the point where you're just doing digital social media, resharing, tagging, linking back message me, if you DM me, if you want muffins to, Hey, I'm going to bring these to a market. 
Yeah. What happened first, markets or pop-ups? Pop-ups. So, so what, how do you approach the pop-ups? Rachel James is a lovely woman with, she's a multi-entrepreneur now, but she had has this crystal shop. She's a local um, business owner and she has this crystal shop called Wild Alabaster. And I remember I was going to like little yoga experiences there and I would go once a week. And um, I went one day and I met Rachel and she was like, well, have you ever done a pop-up? And I'm like, oh, I, I haven't done a pop-up. Like, what does that entail? And she's like, well, you'll bring your business, bring your pop-up table, you know, create the experience through this table that you're going to set up. And that was my first one. And I had all my different friends come through and it was so fun. And I was like, oh, maybe I'll do more of these. And very organically after that, I'd have businesses that would reach out and be like, hey, do you want to do a pop-up? And that is the best thing about Charleston. Charleston is so collaborative and so supportive. This community, when you start something, they come in like a big hug and they immediately want to help you. And no matter what it is, food, any business, people value small business here more than big business. Well, you're bringing value to the table too. You have this incredible product that's hot. People want muffins. and <laughs> People muffins. want muffins. Well, not just any muffins, but like people want to be able to go and eat things that they used to be able to eat, especially at coffee. Like, do you go to coffee shops and just sell it there? Is yeah. Now doing? that we do wholesale. So, so we're in different shops. But, but when you're doing pop-ups, so, so like bring it back to your story. People reach out to you like, Hey, do you want to come do a pop-up? Where were they saying come, come to here? Where yeah. Were so places? for instance, Rachel has that crystal shop. So I went into her crystal shop and popped up in there and then there's tons of crunchy girls want. Them. Yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, <laughs> And then there's actual markets. So there's amazing markets around here. There's a lot that happened in North Charleston because there's, I think, more space. Um, and then there's like they're either at individual businesses and people say pop up on my lawn or there's like 10 of us vendors and we're all at that one business. It's a lot of businesses saying, hey, come it's through like retail. Yeah, retail. Not other not like cafes and coffee shops and things like, like that. the ones that are more so sometimes it can be a coffee shop but maybe like smoothie bars and places that have lunches or places that just have space and create places community that have a demographic yeah the people that are going to buy what you're looking exactly for. and places that just like to create community like ple like a couple of my um wholesale accounts like they have big lawns and they're like okay this is awesome because it not only allows you to sell your goods but it allows the community to come in and buy things you know but then it moved into the charleston city market and that taught me so incredibly much what did it teach you so the charleston city market i swear has to be one of the oldest markets in the entire country or at least I, it might be the oldest market on the southeast i wish there were more markets yeah have you ever been to thailand I haven't, but I always say it's one of the places I really want to go it to. It puts things in perspective. Yeah. Man. Like their markets out there are awesome. Ugh, like they're, can imagine. they're consistent. There's a market every day of the week and you just need to know where to go to look at the markets, but street food and just vendors. And I wish we did more of that. Here. Yeah. I don't know why we don't. Well, in Charleston, it's amazing because markets are just part of the way people live. So it's so cool. So the Charleston city market has vendors who have been there for like, over 20 years and then they have newbies like me and my friend at the time she was selling there and she was like well have you ever considered doing this market with me and it's a whole application process and they have to try your goods and it was honestly that experience was really cool because it set me up for everything else that I ended up doing because when you're in the Charleston city market and you get invited and in to be a part of it it's every walk of life that walks through there it's all the people who are tourists visiting the city so it's not like you have the health nuts. It's not like all the health nuts are just at your booth. It's people from all over the country who have no interest yeah. in your product. And, it, and if you have a like a, a, a product that you're shipping, yeah. now you are you got in front of them. They're going to have those muffins, but I can order these from home. Yeah. And then also it helps grow your following. And then people are like, oh, this is so cool. I got to experience this when I was in Charleston. And But for me, the biggest thing that I took from Charleston City Market was the sales aspect. I had to convince or just explain to people why my muffins were good, even though they had a vegan gluten-free title. Because yeah. people were just walking through and they wanted, they're in the South. They might want something fried or, you but, know, really sugary. Did you do some en menu engineering by this point? Some engineering, reverse engineering, the, the actual value? the cost of these things i hope you did oh, wait as in as in explain further so like are you like weighing out okay there's x amount of grams of this this flour and that oh yes and salt and sugar how much does that cost oh yes yeah. so and at this point at i want to make point, a 15 yes. profit yes you know how, what's the packaging cost like yeah so you're getting your your worth of this getting product. all these things pieces of the puzzle as i went on because once again it's not like i had experience in the space you know so I had to I, like, especially like just looking back, like when I would use the brown paper boxes, right. And that was the packaging. People couldn't see the, the, the product in the packaging. So I had to then figure out, okay, well maybe I need something that's translucent, like the ones that you see now and that's the bundles. And so that may, that actually created a better profit margin, um, by buying those. Cause the brown boxes were almost like, um, recyclable takeout 
um, containers and they were super expensive. And I was getting them from this one site that wasn't, they, they weren't always stocked with it. So I would kind of be rummaging around always. And then if they didn't have it, I had to go to Michael's once again. And so the profit margin was all out of whack with that. So then once I really got consistent with my packaging, then I buying could, bulk. yeah, buying bulk. And also just like finding the resources that are consistent and are stocked and make sense and that you can buy in bulk. That was so major for me. Like I was buying everything from Whole Foods or from the grocery stores or, you know, places you could buy health flowers and health sugars, you know, so that was expensive. How long ago was this when you were in the market? So if you started two years ago, how long did it take you from like first Instagram to first uh, market? I think that I did my first pop up. So I started in Connecticut probably a month before I started the business down here. And that was like what I, my LLC was official. So it was probably end of March or no, in March. So March is when I was like, let me sling these muffins. 2021? 2020. 2020. No, 2021. Sorry. 2021. Yeah. Okay. So 2021 March. A little over two years. Yeah. So 2021 March was when I got the inspiration to sell them. And then I, my family ended up moving here. So I was like, well, I don't want to leave Charleston. I went to college there. Like that's the best. So I ended up fully moving down here. It felt so natural. I was like, why did I ever leave? Cause I never thought I was going to stay here. I thought I was going to move to New York and do one of my past internships that I had done when I was still in school, but the pandemic changed everything, rerouted my entire life. So, um, yeah. So I ended up in Charleston. I was like, I couldn't even imagine that I was going to be back where I went to school, but it was, it just felt right. So then I was here and then probably in like within two months I had maybe my first pop-up. But at that point I was just dropping off. I was driving all around and I was just dropping these brown boxes on people's porch and people were ordering through Instagram and, you know, getting through there. But then I had a pop-up and then I didn't start the Charleston city market until probably October of 2021. And then I did that till December. And then I realized that I kind of couldn't be on just a consistent schedule with just one pop-up because so like seven months after yeah. starting you were doing pop-ups and regular consistent markets yes um and so that whole period of time i was doing pop-ups all that and then i did charleston city market until like the winter and i realized then i had to kind of do more individual ones that didn't just kind of have a set schedule and then i was able to go all around and do different different markets and meet different demographics and different people so how long like after the say a year on average how many muffin how many orders of muffins were you getting a week approximately if you had a guess i was getting a lot i wonder how many that was i need to go back in my brain doesn't have to be exact brain catalog um well let me ask you like how many how many orders are you getting a week now is it has it continued to grow or is it so now we're really in wholesale and that was a really exciting thing that happened So before you got the wholesale how when you're just doing pop-ups and and shipping them yeah like what is a the average amount of orders you were going to get. So if I was doing pop-ups and I was shipping, like I could get like 20 orders. Um, and then I would be doing like the pop-ups. So the pop-ups would would require at least a couple hundred muffins each time. So I was doing in most people's orders, they were getting in the beginning, 12 muffins per order. The packages were the same, whether you're shipping them or no, they were different. Okay. So if I was shipping them in the beginning, they were in like these, (laughs) airtight vac sealed like plastic containers and i was shipping i believe for 16 16 and then people at pop up 16 right those are the options. yeah so 12 and so that was what they were 12 and 16 and then now what they are is the three piece and they moved into three in a um a takeout container and that's for the pop up and that was for the pop up so i would do like i don't know you meet like 30 to 50 people at a pop up and like you could sell all, to all of them and then you could also have a really are bad pop up margins better on this are you are you get, on like, when you're doing not the pop up yeah so the margins for pop-up and then online retail are the same, but then if it's wholesale, you're um, selling it for le- for less to the business and then they're, you know, cause they have to make yeah. a margin on it. So um, yeah, the, whenever I get an order through my website or get an order, you know, at pop-ups, that's awesome. Cause you're getting full price. Were you doing this at the pop-ups? No, I wasn't doing the bundle yet. Just so, 12. No, 12 I was, I was doing the three piece, but they were in the takeout container. Okay. So I was doing the three piece and then I actually would do a six piece mix um, which I had to stop doing once I started doing the bundles, but I would do three pieces of the same flavor. And then at the pop of I would do six different, um, or I would do six pieces, three different flavors. So you'd get two, um, of each flavor in that box. And then once I started having to produce more, I was like, okay, I can only do the three piece. And it was also great because people wanted something that was grab and go, you know, I'm not going to lie. I'm trying to get down to the, the amount of revenue you were doing. I'm, <laughs> I'm trying to reverse engineer. This. So, I'm trying to think back to everything, so honestly, because it's shifted, you know? So you said you were doing 20 orders a week. So 
for yeah, my, let's say that so I was 20 doing orders a week times how much a, an order. Well, actually, I mean, it could be like let's say let's say you're doing so. Oh, this well, this is what we didn't talk about. So it was it was drops. So I would do drops per week. So let's say I did three drops. I would release on my story. Hey, I'm doing a drop. Like this is back when everything was through my DMs. I would be like, hey, I'm doing a muffin drop this week. That's how the name came about. I would do drops like. I'm, dr- I'm doing a, like a shoe drop, you know? I was know? curious about that. Yeah, so yeah. the name actually came from, I was doing drops. And so I would release on my story, hey, here's the muffin drop for this week. Here's the menu. And so I would put on my story the menu and then I would get DMs. So I would get like, let's say 10 DMs on a Tuesday. So that's 10 orders right there. I had to bring myself back to remember where I was because I'm in a fully different phase. And then let's say on Wednesday, I did another one, get another 10 to 15. And then later in the week, you could get the same amount or more. So I could be doing, and what was I selling them for at that time? Let's call it like $20 per order. Okay. Let's say they were doing like $20. So obviously let's put 20 times 30. And then let's say you're doing a pop-up. You can make anywhere from 200 to $500 from a pop-up. Um, yeah. So I was doing, when I was with these pop-ups grinding things? and doing all the pop-ups, I was doing like three to four. I was doing anywhere from one to four a week. And those were grueling. So you're doing about, Three it's like times 2.5 on average, you do 2.5 a week. Yeah, right? let's say that. Like that was what I was averaging. But when I was in grind mode, like I could be doing like four pop-ups a week and it was only me. So that was crazy. So that was actually amazing for revenue, but it was killing me, so right? So you could do between, between uh, sorry, 2,000 and 3,000 a week. Muffins Gross. or oh profit. Yeah. yeah. I, it, that would be well, an amazing gross, week. But yeah. That could be an amazing week if I had a bunch of pop-ups that week. So, yeah. um, but it could be also less if I didn't do a pop-up that week. You know what right. I mean? So that was when I had to shift the business away from just doing pop-ups. But this, this is, this is livable wage. Yeah. You it know, was, it was a little crazy when you're doing all the work yourself and their cost of goods. I mean, what were your cost of goods to produce that many books? Like would you so I think I was able in the beginning because I was doing it out of my apartment and that was a different I, like rent for or no I was actually living out of my parents house in the beginning and I wasn't paying a rent so I had no overhead in the beginning I had no overhead for a like a good amount of time and um that was great because my profit mar- margin was just the ingredients and then you know my labor and that was awesome and then you start having to pay things like rent and you have to start paying for you know gas you mileage and at home anymore right? You're no, no, I'm in a commercial sir. kitchen now, yeah. but like I, we're taking it back to the beginning because there's been phases. So I was a um, cottage law baker for a long time, which allows cottage you to law? cottage law. So that allows you and it's different per state, but it allows you to sell direct to consumer. So if you're making it out of your home and there's different laws in every state. Um, and so South Carolina is one that is a lot more not loosey goosey, but they're a lot better with it. And they've gotten even better. Like you can actually sell, I think, small amounts to wholesale as long as you're only making a certain amount per year. Um, which you could not do when I started. I'm having another yeah, d- dig in. But so, um, so yeah, now I have to pay for rent. And then also you have to think about retail tax. You have a retail sales tax every week that you have to pay. Um, or not every week, every month. You're so good. Yay. That's amazing. You should, yeah. oh, you can see. I was going to say, you guys should see his reaction. It's pretty great. YouTube.com slash restaurant unstoppable podcast. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, you're taking me back. I have to remember all the details because now we're in a fully different phase. We do wholesale. I have a website that people can order through. You know, I didn't even have a website in the beginning. So how many orders are you getting today on just say website orders? So I would say that the the website orders probably are still pretty consistent. Like you can get like anywhere 10 to 20. Like if you do, I'll still do kind of like, I'll still be like, I'm shipping on X day, right? So I'll be like, I'm shipping on Tuesday. But I would say right now, majority of our revenue is becoming is coming from wholesale and wholesale? stuff like that. Yeah. How many, and how many accounts do you have? So and growing from wholesale. So we've got twelve. Wow. And then, um, and honestly, like, what, I want to take on more and more, but you need hands. I also want to remind the listeners: you started this two years ago, yeah. as a project, and people are like, you should just start selling this. Like, yeah. you haven't even started yet. Yeah, barely. You and you know, and I just want to like. Like, I love talking to people like you who are like, usually like, when I first started this podcast, I made it a rule that you can't be a guest on the show unless you have been open for at least five years. Oh, no way. And I changed that to, I'm going to prioritize called out guests Yeah. for exactly this reason, because success recognizes success. Hustle recognizes hustle. Yeah. Grind recognizes grind. Yeah. You know, and Carrie Graves was just like, this lady's doing it. <laughs> And she and I have a lot of respect for her and the folks over at Uptown Social and they are grinders. Yeah, too. So, I, and, I have always said, like I always tell people, Uptown Social is my favorite bar because they just have that New York grind. They have that grind in them, and they don't, t- you know, they just do it. You know, yeah. like you just you can see it. You said what, what, what was that quote you just said? Success finds success or yeah, recognizes it success. Does. It you totally you can see it in other people and it's amazing. Yeah. So uh, I, I loved. I would have never found you otherwise. 
this. Yeah, you that's know? awesome. I mean, Thanks, Kara. And, um, and, and, and your story is more relevant, really, than some of... I mean, I, this isn't a bash against Mickey Basque, one of the mayor of Charleston, oh. the official mayor of Chal- Charleston. He had an incredible story, too. But he started in, like, the 70s. Mm. It's, the world is different. It's so different. And, like, we, a lot of the basics are still the same, you know, like how to be a great leader and how to treat people well and how to surround yourself with great... Like, all that stuff hasn't yeah. changed. But the, the details to how to start, the specifics of, like, how you scale from Instagram to pop-ups to markets to wholesale and what, what what haven't we discussed well i also want to tell you like in food especially when you have a product that's going to be in stores and i mean i know you know this because you talk to a bunch of people you have to go through so much licensing and stuff like that and things you know take time when you're somebody who wants to learn all the pieces and i think people always come to me a lot or they're, they're not like or they'll be like why don't you just get you know funding from somebody you have an awesome recipe and like you can just hire all these people and i'm like i want to be a part of the process like i know we'll get there and i know where we're going like I like to learn all the pieces. Like one day I'm going to be like, yeah, you were the one making it. And now it's, you know, made by a co-packer and it's getting sold X amount and all that stuff. And it's super exciting to like see the pieces that you've learned along the way, because there's so much that I've learned. And like now too, like I'm in a managerial position almost. And like, I have people making the product for me. And do you know how long it took me to feel comfortable giving somebody else my recipe and feeling like, don't comfortable yeah i mean and like you have copyrighted everything but right? yeah i mean everything okay, i have all my you. legal figured out don't worry but uh, more so, so have a talk after this call yeah but yeah. even so like more so just feeling comfortable and being like yeah but that was like my soul that i put into that product like and having somebody else's hands on it like that took me a minute to come around to and so it's been really trust cool is, isn't like conceptually it's easy right yeah extending trust actually doing it is not easy yeah, yeah. and you really have to i feel like i have a really good gut that's developed through all my autoimmune and through all of my health stuff that (laughs) gut literally but like the senses I get in my gut of like who I want to surround myself with and you know the time that I want to spend in certain places and I've really had to fine-tune that like I don't drink anymore and that for me has allowed me to do so many things and have clarity um and you know there's just different things that have really like tested my boundaries and like have allowed me to sharpen those things and have helped me so much as a business owner that goes back to like you learn through your business and you learn in your life you know, it's very much the same thing. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Um, so, so you have the Instagram. You're still, are you still taking orders through Instagram, or are you just redirecting to the website? Yeah, no, I always am like place the order through the website. <laughs> Here's a link to the website. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then, so you are you still doing pop ups? So we'll do pop ups, but it's nice because I have somebody to do them. Yeah. So it's great. Which like that was killing me for so long because it was so such an amazing thing. I mean, I love pop-ups because you actually get to, com- to meet your community and everything. But for me, when I was doing the baking, the popping up, the everything, I was it was a lot of really hard work. Like everybody who makes fun of me because there's a local coffee shop called Brown Fox Coffee. And that was one of my pop-ups I was doing so consistently. But I mean, I'm somebody who doesn't sleep, so I'll get it done. And I would go and when it was like 30 degrees in Charleston and sit outside, no heat, like nothing like that at my table, just trying to sell these muffins at Brown Fox. And they gave me such a leg up because I was consistently there every Tuesday. We would do Brown Fox Tuesday. And it was amazing because I would meet the community there and really build, you know, friendships through that. Um, and we still do pop-ups because you have to be involved in the community, you know, and it's just nice to have help. Markets, right? I don't do Charleston city market, but, yeah. um, What'd you say? Why not? Well, they re- they required a consistent schedule. And so when I stopped doing that, I just realized I needed to be able to do all different types of things, you know? Yeah. But I mean, I recommend the city market to anybody who's starting a business. You learn so much. It's ridiculous. Yeah. I got to connect you with Callie. Yeah. I, I, you know what? I, wa- I would love. It's not Callie. It's Carrie. And I did so <laughs> good. I didn't call her Cal- Callie one time during the interview. And I knew I knew at some point today I was going to mess up and call Carrie Maury Callie. Callie I, didn't, I thought her name was Callie. Callie's so her amazing. mom. They're named after her mom. Oh, and I, I was like, that. I am going to screw this up. And I did so well. I knew it was just a matter of Hey, you're just giving her a promo. It's, it's <laughs> great. And that's yeah. the name of her but brand. Her story sounds very similar to yours. Where really? She, just started, she started with mail order. She cool. th- that's and, and from there it grew to... Um, basically it was mail order. What, what else did she do? I think it was just, yeah, it was just mail order until she started doing the little, like, um, the, the retail, but for her and her mind, she's like, I'm not looking to profit off the retail. I just want to get myself in front of people. Yeah. You know, like I just want people to know that this thing exists here. Like she was selling all over the country, but not in Charleston. Yeah. And she's like, and so many people come to Charleston and like, if you can make your brand, uh, what's the word conducive or uh, anonymous with, mm-hmm. Not, not synonymous. synonymous. Yeah. If you can make your brand synonymous with Charleston, like, I don't know, like it's good to like, 
I feel like you have an opportunity to kind of do that. Yeah. I, I don't know. Maybe biscuits are a little more Charleston-esque. No, but you know, but. it's crazy. You would really, you would be so surprised by how much access there is here to amazing vegan so gluten-free stuff. Through, yeah. And also people who are so interested. There's a really big gluten-free population here, um, which I was so surprised about. Like I thought when I was moving the muffin drop here that or starting it like there wasn't going to be a lot and there was such a place for it and it's just growing every day and you we we never really got to continue what you asked about but you're like how do you get autoimmune all right and such an interesting part of it is so much of it relates to our food our environment what we're you know taking in our air our water source you know there's so many different things that can it doesn't even have to be genetic you know you can just develop it through our existence and that's you know if you're a super sensitive being and i have been pretty much my whole life you can be more susceptible to things like that. And it's very, it's so integrative of all different parts of your body, but it's a very emotional d- disease. Like a lot of your traumas and your experiences feed into it and sort of healing those things can help heal your autoimmune, which is a really crazy cool. part of it to learn. Um, but yeah, it's, it's really cool. Cause here in Charleston, there actually is so many people and you just wouldn't even realize that there's people with autoimmune everywhere who are looking for food that makes them feel good. Mm-hmm. And it's really growing here yeah. in Charleston. Yeah. Not just autoimmune, but people who want gluten-free. <laughs> any, any aspect of your business, strategy of your business, something that you can offer up to somebody who might want to take the, a similar approach to what you've taken as far as getting their one thing out to the world. Yeah. Um, I we think... we haven't covered yet. Well, I, th- I honestly think you just have to do... Like, start. You yeah. have to start. Like, I think really... And I think you'll probably hear so many people say that, but it took me so long to feel comfortable putting these muffins out in the world. And also, you have to feel a certain level of readiness in yourself but really the only way to start is to start you know and so you gotta just you really gotta like stop caring what everybody thinks and I know that sounds so easy to say but it controls so many people's lives thinking about what other people are thinking about them and I think social media is a big thing even feeling comfortable to share like that's taken me a lot of time to feel comfortable with because you know it's not something that you feel naturally like looking into a camera and talking but I think if you just put yourself out there and you really trust in and believe in like what you're into, like if you're passionate about something, it can create a whole life for you. Like that passion can create everything. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And I I know that might've sounded a little cliche, but it really is the crux of it. If you love something so much, you can start it. Yeah. And it it makes showing up much easier. Yeah. You know, make it Uh, your life. (laughs) So restaurant unstoppables mission statement is to inspire, empower and transform the industry. Um, When we think about transforming the industry, going into the future, like where do you think the industry is headed and how can we be intentional about how we get there? I think a lot of people are starting to realize the connection between what they eat and how they feel. And I think it's funny. Like I always talk about TikTok now because it's amazing. If you are using it in a way that you can, you know, self-regulate and scroll past things that make you uncomfortable. Um, there's a lot of information of people just like me sharing their experiences and how they've healed themselves and what they've done. And there's a lot of people on that app recognizing the parallel between food and how they feel and you know how they go about their life and you would not even like believe the bubbling underneath the surface of what's happening and I I just think it's amazing and so I think really where the food industry is going is people being really um, hyper vigilant about what they're putting in their body. So reading ingredient labels. Yep. Nobody even, I, a lot of people are not versed in reading an ingredient label. I think we're going in this direction too. I think food for the longest time was seen as, you know, I mean, I think if we're going all the way back, you know, back beyond 10,000 years ago, food was literally life. Like we exist to go find it and work together to to collect it, forage it, kill it, come together, process it. Our lives revolved around food. And I think as we got more into the agricultural revolution and food became more abundant and we kind of, we learned how to process it. And I think we kind of forgot we like, we our, our relationship with food almost got like, there's like, a it disconnect. fuels us. Like if we yeah. don't eat, we it, don't have energy, it's you literally know, life. Like do we, it is. do we eat anything that wasn't once living? Yeah. I mean, it's pretty crazy. Do we? I mean, unless it's man-made and you know, like uh, a chemical, <laughs> right. Or like a pill or something like yeah. that or a drug, yeah. like, we literally like, like we food is life. like it's food, food, food is, is life. literally life. Yep. It was once living and it makes us stay alive. Yeah. And it's all connected. Yep. Like literally it's all connected. It's a part of a system. And yep. we got it, it like food almost became transactional. Yeah. And it was just something to like fill my belly. And yeah. How, how can I get the most of it for the least amount of money? Yeah. And we're starting to, and like it took, I think a, like a hundred years or more, a couple hundred years for people to like to get so good at processing yeah. it and making it cheap and abundant that we're just finally over the past 50 years starting to like 
it's starting to affect us, yeah. you know? And I think we're... And it's ca- it's catching up, you know? And a lot of people in the yeah. autoimmune, that's like yeah. what's triggering so many people, but you know? S- but we're starting to to, rec- to recognize that we need to respect the natural system, the natural process. I hope we are. Yeah, I, th- <laughs> I hope so too. And it was actually one of the things I want to talk to you about because I'm curious. Um, so are you, how do you, are you vegan? Yeah. Um, where, what are your thoughts on mono farming, mono agriculture? Oh, as in like GMO related? Is that what you're saying? Or? No, like, so a lot of, there's a lot of pushback for people who are vegan or not everybody's vegan because of the, like, like animal rights and stuff. Yeah. Like that. Some people just do it because it makes them feel great. Yeah. You know, it's a choice to feel good. Um, and they argue like, oh, like, you know, eat more soy, you know, yeah. eat more like whatever mass produced product, whatever it's soy. What are some of the other one? Like, I mean, um, the corn, soy, rice, yeah, like rice. those are some of the biggest crops, you know, and the most, you know, contaminated, too. So I guess what I'm going where I'm going with this, you see, like the like the Beyond Burger, Incredible Burger. Oh, or, yeah. And like all these like fake meats. And yeah. Like, you look at that and you're like, OK, maybe that is better than a bunch of cows farting, you know, but it's, but, in, yeah. But at the same time, wiping out ecosystems to mass produce soybean is not good either. And yep. the chemicals that would go into like, you know, managing all that is not good for the system yeah. either. So it's almost, it just kind of feels like a load of bullshit sometimes yeah. when I look at people who are so focused on vegan to save the world. It's like not the way you're doing it. Yeah. Where, where, what are your thoughts on my that? My perspective so really lies in my own healing journey, you know? So this is why I started with when we st- started talking about lifestyle and diet changes that everybody has a different experience. So for me, I know what works for me, right? Yeah. Because I've vetted it. I've tried it. I've tried all the things. Like I've had a, you know, a Big Mac when I was little, you know, I've tried all the things. I've had yeah. everything. Um, but for me, what worked was whole, whole, um, whole foods. So like actual, like, you know what the ingredient is. You You see the lettuce, you see the sweet potato. (laughs) It looks like an apple. You know, you're, you're eating what comes from the earth. And for me, that's always just been what I've kind of lived by. Anything processed immediately upset me. So like when I was having really bad autoimmune issues, it was affecting my gut. Right. So I would get immediate bloating. I would have really bad stomach issues. And so processed foods have never been a part of my journey. And I mean, it just has never worked for me and never been healing. So things like Beyond Burger, big things like that, I've never resonated with. And also I've never really resonated with my body with eating meat. So I wasn't going to then go to a fake meat, you know? And also I have a really good friend who's doing amazing for herself. She's grown a massive following and she talks about healing through food, but hers is the complete opposite me. And she's eating meat and she's eating like butter and all different types of animal fats and we just called the other day and we were talking about how we have so much respect for each other's different positions because it all just comes back to eating whole foods whole ingredients that you know what they are and not processed and so I think that's where I stand like process things that when you can't understand what the ingredient is in them you your body doesn't understand it yeah. either it's a foreigner yeah. i can get behind that i also like the idea of regenerative farming i don't know if you're familiar with what's yeah, going yeah 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 that's i i mean anything that's more you know yeah because like conducive the, for the earth like cows are bad for the environment but they're also great for the environment when they're when you mimic the natural cycle yeah you know when they're fertilizing the earth and providing nutrients to the food you're going to grow totally and eventually that cow is going to get old yeah. you're not gonna let the meat go to waste yeah I mean, maybe you could throw the carcass on the garden and let that go into the soil and that could regenerate you know full circle yeah. but i it's don't think it's evil i think it's just we've we've then industrialized it yeah it's the industrialization That's what's evil. exactly yeah the industrialization um, is absolutely the evil we, part yeah if we look at nature and then we try to recreate the natural process like there's a place for all of it and totally honestly i feel like the the amount of cows that it takes to bring back the earth is probably equal to the amount of ratio of vegetable to protein you should be eating you know what i'm saying yeah like you probably should be eating a lot more vegetables than protein and it takes very few cows to fertilize the amount of land that can feed a lot of people. Yeah. You know where I'm going with this? Yeah, no, so, I get you. Anyway, anything we haven't talked about, now's the time to get it out before we go to the speed round. Yeah, I mean, I think that we've covered a lot of good bases. I feel pretty good about what we're talking but about. The food as medicine is definitely the future. Yeah, and I mean, that's the crux of it. And reading ingredient labels and understanding what to even look for and yeah. um, finding the resources that you resonate with, with what people are talking about. And if it lights you up, that's yeah. what you should follow. I, I think big pharma is a big, a, a big culprit of like, oh, you feel sick? Eat this chemical. Yeah. So we can get rich. And that's been very, that's in a, you know, that, that takes a lot of unlearning to sort of 
disassociate yourself from everything that you have learned since you were little of, you know, taking different medicines to heal you and then, you know, bringing yourself farther away from nature. And yeah. I think for me, what's worked for me is connecting myself closer towards, you know, the earth and what's kind of brought us here. And, you know, those principles of really healing me and the earth has really <laughs> helped heal me. Like, you know, the vegetables and all the beautiful things that it produces. And I don't think a chemical really has ever done that for me. Right. <laughs> awesome stuff. One more quick break to thank our sponsors. We'll be right back. To <laughs> we're back. And the first question I have for you is what is your it factor habit or trait a characteristic you believe most contributes to your success? Strength. What is your biggest weakness? Overthinking. What is one actually have you grown a team yet? I'm building it. That's where we're at. I guess we just didn't we didn't talk about that where we're at now, but um yeah, building So it. as you're building your team, what are you looking for in a team member? Honesty. How do you know if someone's honest? Feel it in my bones. <laughs> in, in that gut that you've been in working on? In that gut on? that I'm talking about. Yeah. Uh, what is uh, the biggest challenge you're facing today? Hmm. Um, making my product shelf stable. How are you overcoming it? Um, asking lots of people different questions and how they made theirs shelf stable. And once again, trying to keep my product as close to its beginnings as possible. That's will always probably be my ethos with it. So it's, you know, just an informationally based journey. <laughs> um, what is one book that's a must read to make us a better person or food and beverage person? Um, it is called the almanac. It's not necessarily just towards food and Bev. Um, it's about entrepreneurship and sort of following that one thing that you do best in the world. It's the almanac of, ugh, I'm going to get it wrong, but Naval Ramakant, I believe his name is the almanac of Raval Naval Ramakant. Sorry, that's mouthful. But um, he has an amazing book, which really, if you have something that lights you up and you have something you're passionate about, he will motivate you to wanting to start something around it. And what was the biggest lesson you learned from that book? That if you have one thing that you feel you do best in the world, that is what you should be pursuing. Yeah, yeah and I make these muffins damn good. <laughs> damn good. Uh, what is one piece of technology you've recently adopted within your business that's had a huge impact? Going on TikTok? I'm not kidding. I learned so much from TikTok because people, once again, like you and me, they tell their stories and business owners. And I love learning from it. Do you it. create on TikTok? We've recently started creating on TikTok. I think I'm doing a lot more of my personal creating, like of sharing my story and my brand on that. Um, but I really use it as a tool for learning. I'm not kidding. What's your strategy for creating? On TikTok? Yeah. Just sharing, sharing stories. I like just telling different things about thyroid facts or stories that I went through with my thyroid or, you know, different things that have kind of led me to here, just being honest and sharing myself. Uh, and this is the last question. Okay. I get a lot of eye rolls with this question. That's because it's a doozy. So okay. get ready. If you got the news, you'd be leaving this world. All the memories of you and your businesses would be lost with your departure with the exception of three pieces of wisdom that you could leave behind for the good of humanity and for your legacy. What would those three pieces of wisdom be? I'm trying to remember the whole question, but I think it's basically like, what are the three pieces of wisdom that you, you have, you can for sure say for true. This is, this is good advice. I love making other people feel heard. I love hearing other people's experiences and being able to connect with them. Make others feel heard. Yeah. Make others feel heard. Um, true. create something that creates positivity. So my muffins, I, I, they're filled with positivity. So therefore I think their ripple effect is creating positivity. Help people feel heard, create positivity through your product. And three. I hope I lead by example. And you know, the more I get more honest about everything that I've been through and all the health struggles that it will inspire other people. So just being upfront about what you've been through and, you know, really sharing in order to help other people. And this has been a lot of fun, Emily. Thank you so much for being so like ready to do this interview. Like I reached out to you, I think less than 24 hours ago. Yeah. I, I think, think it was literally like 9 PM. It was 9 PM. <laughs> I was like, Oh shit. I forgot them. I was, I meant to message you, but I was running around. I was like, crap, 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 crap. Um, I meant to mention like uh, literally meant to do it like right after she like let me know that you're interested and that my life just got away from me. I'm sorry. Hey, we did it. We yeah, were we made here. It happen. Less than 24 hours. Makeshift um, little studio that we created. It was a beautiful experience. This is my life. Yeah. <laughs> this is, this is normal right here, but you were a great guest. And, uh, if we are actually, before we find out the contact information, who do you respect and admire? Somebody like, if you found out there were guests on the show, spilling their guts, sharing their knowledge and wisdom, you would absolutely tune in. Like anybody in this world? Anybody in this world. Oh my goodness. That is a great question. 
have to dive into that into my psyche. Why Didn't you mention to somebody earlier? Oh, well, locally, locally, and I mean, in general, Helen Hall is an, uh, is an incredible businesswoman and just person, and she's great at sharing everything that she's been through, and I love being able to watch her grow her business and um, do everything that she does in life because she's super inspirational, and she makes these things called blender bombs, which are nutrient-dense um, balls of pretty much happiness that you can throw in your, in your blender and make it um, filled with amino acids and fiber and all that good stuff. Beautiful. And how can we connect with you if we maybe want to learn more about your process and how you got here? Maybe we want to join your team. Yeah. And uh, grow with you. Or sure. uh, what else? Maybe we just want to buy some muffins. Yeah. So you want to buy muffins, go to the muffindrop.com. The good news is, is it's pretty much the muffin drop everywhere. So at the muffin drop on Instagram, at the muffin drop on Facebook. I don't use Facebook as much, but and then it's Emily Eld is me. That's my new account that I created. And that's where I'm kind of trying to just share. Why did you shift away? I was curious about that. Why did I shift away from my other account? Yeah. I feel like I love starting new and I like trying things that are new. And I felt a little bit tethered to maybe a past version of myself. I get that. Um, and I like creating new versions of myself and I like being different every single day. So I wanted to be able to feel more authentic and create a base that felt like they wanted to hear what I was going to say, you know, and I felt just like super excited being able to just like speak as much as I want to speak on this new space. So we got the the website, we got the handle, anything else? TikTok? So the same? It's oh yeah, it's just going to be the same. So it's Emily L, it is me personally, and then at the muffin drop on awesome. TikTok as well. So. This is episode 995. Head over to restaurantstoppable.com slash 995. We'll have a summary of today's discussion as well as any tools, services, uh, tools of the services or books recommended and how to connect with Emily. Emily, now is when I say there is no questioning. You are unstoppable. Oh, wow. I needed that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.